Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans in the diaspora, and anybody who's joining us tonight on Make Your Mark with Zim. For those who have been following this program for the last eight or so weeks, you might be familiar with the fact that we weekly come together and talk about things that are topical as they relate to COVID-19. Solidarity Trust Zimbabwe is gracious enough to host this panel and inform the nation on what is going on on the ground. So before we start with our incredible panel of doctors today, I'm going to pass over to Karen as the numbers build up once she's done, I'll zoom back in and then just talk about who we have on tonight's show and what the show is actually about today. Hey everybody, good evening Zimbabwe. It's a pleasure to be back again. I had quite a funny call this afternoon from one of my friends. Well, actually a designer that I work with who was like, oh my goodness, Karen, you have COVID? <laughs> so I said, no, I don't. <laughs> because the, the post that I sent out said, if you know, I've been diagnosed with COVID, what next? And so I said, no, I haven't. <laughs> an update on what Satsum is up to, but we're moving forward um, slowly but surely. We've got um, some fantastic memorandum of understandings going on with um, a couple of NGOs as well as with ministries. So we are quite excited about that because there's life beyond COVID for Satsum, which is fantastic to just be able to continue to resuscitate the health sector and um, possibly look at you know, food kitchens and education and a few other things as well. So we're very excited about that. We've also started to look at some of our other uh, projects like Marlborough Clinic and Arcadia Clinic, Ekusileni. We're still raising money for all of those different health facilities. Some of our people have been to go and visit Pararenyatwa and they've said it's coming along beautifully. They've done a lot of work and they're going to have at least 400 beds or more, which is great. So everything is go, 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 but um, it's really important to talk about current issues. So I'll hand over back to Mucha and I will participate at some point when we talk about testing positive and being in the workforce since I am an employer as well. Yes, Thanks, Mucha. indeed. Thanks, Karen. Right, so anyone who's joining us, welcome again. Uh, tonight we have a panel called So I Have COVID. Now what? And we thought to speak to medical practitioners with the view to dig their brain a little bit and understand what living with COVID is actually like. Now, I'm going to be a little bit abstract with this idea of living with COVID. Abstract from the perspective of a doctor who's discovered that there's a novel virus that they need to make a plan, understand its dynamics, understand its character, and indeed how to treat it. So if they physically have COVID to contend with. And then, of course, from the patient's point of view, the broader social dynamics at play that we will touch on as well. So anyone who's watched the news will be aware that official numbers are now sitting at around 450,000 globally deaths that are COVID related. And of course, there's been much excitement on the market this week with the discovery of dexamethasone, how that might be the cure that everybody's waiting for. So a lot of questions really to the medical practitioners about what life may well be like for that person who's been diagnosed. On the panel, we've got Dr. Kazai Masunda, the head of epidemiology and disease control. He works as a public health physician, and he's one of our experts in the front lines of Zimbabwe. We've got Dr. Jerry Zipojga, who's a pulmonary critical care doctor. We've seen him around on Facebook since COVID started. And then we've got Dr. Nicholas Manyonga, who is a coordinator for the 2019 number. So he's the medical guy behind the hotline amongst many other things. He's also a doctor, obviously, and he will give us a unique perspective. Dr. Masinda, what inspired you to get involved in the hotline? Would you mind just talking us <laughs> yeah, through why the yeah. hotline? Why was that necessary? Basically, what he inspired us to uh, take part in the hotline is that he, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is something that needed to be managed first away from the medical facilities as the main intention was to make sure that we flatten the curve as far as the health institutions are concerned. So there was need to capacitate uh, the aspect of the core responders that uh, SOTZIM has been supporting right from the onset, where we are basically providing uh, a soft landing for people all over the country where they call 2019 and have an opportunity to speak to medical practitioners. And therefore, we, we can then be in a position to uh, triage these patients whilst they are still at their homes without them having to visit um, healthcare service providers. To, have, to give them an opportunity to have first-hand information from the doctors and nurses that are manning these calls. 
and also to act as the link between the caller and uh, the various uh, pillars within the ministry that are also working on this. You find that uh, there is uh, the surveillance team that needs to uh, get information on invest in event-based surveillance that also are assisted through the information that comes through the hotline. Then there is the uh, rapid response teams that need to attend to would be suspected cases of COVID, either for uh, transfer to health facilities or for uh, PCR sample collection uh, that would happen at the homes of these people. So as people are also in self-isolation, sometimes they get so anxious wanting to make sure they are supported through the various systems that government have put in place to support people that are uh, um, having COVID or that would have been in self-quarantine. We provide that platform through people calling 2019, which is a toll-free number. And then the doctors that receive these calls after assessing the need and necessity will then activate the various system for a response. Uh, this is what is happening as far as the hotline is concerned. So when I'm sitting hearing about this hotline, I'm thinking of the social determinants of health. I'm thinking of the dynamics of where people live, how they're transported, how their house, their income, their access to medical care. And then I kind of transpose a model like that is fantastic for, for Zim, especially where the numbers have been manageable. Moving across to you, Dr. Jerry, you're in the USA. You guys have had some incredibly high numbers. I'm thinking of that person who wants to go to hospital because they've got a stomach ache. They're told that they can't come in because first priority goes to COVID-19. It turns out that, I don't know, they've got acute appendicitis for argument's sake, ruptured appendix, septicemia, death. So this is not a direct COVID-related death in the sense that they don't actually have the virus. But talk us through some of the challenges that people who are non-COVID victims have, have faced and how you've kind of tried to manage that in the absence maybe of the hotline such as Zimbabwe has? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it, it is a problem that we faced uh, early on, uh, not only because people would call and were told, oh, don't come in unless you're ill, but because people were genuinely afraid to come to the hospital because they were fearful. That's where people who have COVID are. So they were scared to come and contract COVID while at the hospital. So I think eventually once all of this dies down, we will find that there were people who had delay of care because of COVID. Uh, how have we dealt with it uh, as a hospital or as a health community? We've tried to communicate now more and more with patients. Look, if you are actually feeling sick and or you have something that's acutely wrong, you should come in. You should come into the hospital. The chances of you getting it, uh, as hospitals were being careful, I know back home people have quarantines and they have specific parts of the hospital that are set up for people who have COVID. It's the same here, whereby we try to avoid having people who have COVID mixing with just regular people who are coming in for other issues. We screen everyone for COVID. We check them for fevers. We check them for respiratory symptoms, but we screen. So what I would say in that is uh, we have definitely seen a delay in care for people who are scared to come into the hospital because they're scared of catching COVID. And honestly, if you are feeling sick, you should definitely go and and be evaluated because uh, we're doing things as hospitals to try and make sure that you're protected from getting COVID when you come in. But uh, it'll be an issue long term, unfortunately. So any idea of the sort of death toll then, if you are to take these indirect deaths, and this is a bit of a pie in the sky question, what proportion of mortalities do you think might be a result of COVID related, but not quite COVID illnesses? Hard to say? <laughs> it is very, <laughs> it's a baited question and it's, it's very hard to say, but I mean, honestly, so for me, one of the things we do is screen for lung cancer and the quicker you can get someone into care, the better. And we found some people genuinely just didn't want to come in no matter what conversation you had. So there'll be these indirect long-term morbidity issues with COVID and, and it's hard to quantify, but I imagine it'll, it'll be a lot. So I'm not putting myself in Dr. Kudai's shoes. He's our epidemiologist. He's the guy who's kind of understanding the character of viruses and making recommendations to the Ministry of Health, presumably. When you heard that COVID is in town, what did you think? And how did you find the transition from understanding the initial sentiment behind the virus to actually needing to come up with a plan, to come up with a treatment plan, emergency response, policies, and so forth for the various hospitals that you, you serve? I will attempt the question, uh, though <laughs> the specialized question. Basically, you find that um, when an epidemic is declared or a pandemic is declared, there are various uh, public health issues that needs to be looked at. 
And uh, this is why the country's preparedness basically was to be called into place where eight pillars had to be established to look into all these issues. And uh, these uh, pillars would relate to issues of um, uh, surveillance, contact tracing, as well as rapid response, where you want to also be quick to identify what spots as far as the disease is concerned and mount a response that assists to prevent the spread of the infection and be able to quickly uh, provide care for those that would need care. You tend to have also a pillar of case management where expert physicians would then meet to ensure that they quickly look into the management of the cases that may need, that are moderate to severe and continue to explore new information as you would find that uh, there are a lot of things that may be said that may be coming through but you need your own local experts that then look into this. And this team of experts have now put through the third edition now in, the, this, uh, in the last month of the treatment guidelines as far as COVID is concerned in the country. You need to have that uh, state of preparedness as far as the actual management and the effectiveness of that management is concerned. You will also have to have the pillar of laboratories where you find that you need to up your game as far as the testing is concerned. So you need to have a pillar that looks directly as far as testing is concerned. I'm sure you saw that when the uh, pandemic reached us, the number of tests we were doing per day tend to then have increased in terms of uh, uh, what uh, we were seeing. Yeah, and then that was the laboratory pillars upping their game as far as mm. the response is concerned. You will also then look into the risky communication and community engagement, where you find that you always want to make sure that the right messages reach the right people at the right time, and also to make sure that you engage the communities. And uh, this would assist as far as issues of then infection prevention and control is concerned. When you have community engagement, when you have community leaders taking a uh, lead in spreading the right messages, that would also assist as far as uh, that is concerned. All these pillars, then what they do is to feed into uh, the responses or the leadership roles that then happens. So when you find that when lockdowns are then introduced, they are trying to make sure that you spread, you reduce the spread of infection whilst you are giving time to the preparedness as far as the hospitals, the doctors, the issues of uh, making sure that all the protective personal protective equipment is in place to make sure that your testing is up there. That's why you then introduce the local to uh, 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 the total lockdowns that we, we experienced. It was then giving time to make sure that you are prepared. When you are at a certain level of preparedness, that's when you start then seeing the lockdowns being eased because now you can be able to cope with whatever cases come through. This is how the public health experts assist to feed into that. As all that is happening, you find that we started having people that were returning and quarantine centers now were in place to ensure these people get into yeah, these centers. Imagine if these people were, were to come back and there were no quarantine centers, looking at the numbers that we are experiencing in quarantine centers, they would have then led to serious community transmissions. So you will find that the way of even the wearing of masks, what we were talking about in January and what we were talking about in May was different. All that information is information that is provided through the public health experts that meet every time through the various pillars that government would have put in place as far as the preparedness is concerned. You, 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 you then have to make sure that the, uh, the decisions that are made are then informed the decisions. Because at some point, you still have to balance the health medical issues and the socioeconomic issues. Wonderful. So this idea of balancing the social and medical economic issues. I want to actually now start to drill down because the topic of tonight's title is I've got COVID, now what? And we are seeing that there's a lot happening in current affairs with the Black Lives Matter movement. So people are feeling compelled to go and be heard and be seen. But to go out on mass as people are in an environment such as this must be the worst nightmare of a doctor who's then having to deal with the aftermath should there be a spread of COVID in those particular bases. Beyond 
advance that sort of broad umbrella, Dr. Jerry, tell me your thoughts around the quality of healthcare in African American communities, particularly, because this is something that's become quite topical, where people feel that there's a disproportionate number of Black people dying from COVID-19, and that may well be due to some systematic, some fundamental issues in the way that care is provided. What are your views on that? Yeah, no, and that's I appreciate important. that this is a sensitive issue. I respect that, but I'd love to hear what you think. It is, uh, but it's the, it's the topic of the day, right? And, and we do, we have to address this. From our perspective, there's been disenfranchisement uh, which of African-Americans, Black Americans uh, in this country. Uh, it's not just in terms of the care that they get, but it's from a socioeconomic standpoint to the point of do they have good health insurance? It's an interesting thing whereby if you don't have health insurance, people are fearful to go and seek care from doctors because of the financial cost of it if you don't have health insurance. So then that leads people to delay care and eventually come in when they're very ill. So I think that plays a role in people having worse outcomes is that they they delay their presentation. In terms of uh, actual providers providing bad care to uh, Black Americans, uh, that that it is a loaded question, but I think it's, it's a question that needs to be asked. There's a lot of intrinsic bias uh, tests that are going out now whereby we're asking ourselves as physicians, obviously I don't know of any physician who would say, oh, I want to treat this Black person worse. Uh, in the UK, uh, this Black or Middle Eastern person uh, badly, or whoever it is, whichever country it is. I don't know of doctors who go into this thinking that's what they want to do. But we have these intrinsic biases that make it so that potentially we're giving better care to certain people, be it based on their color or their socioeconomic status or the fact that they have fam- they're wealthy enough, they have family members available who are asking these questions for them. So mm-hmm. all that to say, I think there is within the medical community, and it's a tough thing to say, but I think we potentially do treat people differently based on their color, based on their socioeconomic status. I've had to reevaluate myself, and I the other day took one of these intrinsic bias tests to see, do I have this bias that I'm not aware of that's not external, but potentially affects how I give care to people? So I hope that answers your question. I think it was a two-part question. I'm happy to answer the second part. It's spot on. My shock came from reading a statistic, for instance, that pointed to Chicago and stated that while only a percent of the population is African-American, 70% of COVID-related deaths are from that African-American community. So that really does strike a chord to what is going wrong in care. Is it that we're not seeking, as you quite rightly point out, because there's no medical insurance, or is it just negligence on the basis of going to highly dense hospitals where you're contending with gunshot wounds and triage emergency type issues so that COVID person comes in, goes back, because they can't be bothered to deal with all of that. But this is quite a deep social issue that I'm not sure could ever be answered on a panel such as this. I just thought it'd be interesting to to talk to it. And whilst this is a a peculiar issue, perhaps to the Americas, the equivalent might be said about Zimbabwe. So Dr. Nick, if you think about the access to medical care, that person who's Kumusha, who may not have access to a big hospital, who suffers in silence, yes, there's the helpline, but sometimes there's an attitude to say that that's for everybody else. What are you doing to appeal to to marginalized members of society who may not naturally seek medical support? Uh, Thank you, uh, Mucha. Uh, Basically, what um, uh, the government has done through the Ministry of Health and various uh, pillars and working groups is to come up with uh, guidelines that assist um, uh, our people in various centers and also the countrywide trainings that have been extended to all the people that are involved in healthcare as far as COVID is concerned. So you will find that our setup basically has got, um, uh, basically if I started the lower level, we have what we call community health workers, uh, where you find every patient uh, out there in the rural setup knows who their community health worker is. And these community health workers have been trained as far as um, the handling of patients suspected to be having COVID are concerned. Why I'm using the uh, word suspected of having COVID is the very fact that they are not immediately diagnosed and confirmed positive once they start having these particular symptoms and they are out there in the rural uh, areas because there is the aspect of sample collection, uh, there is the aspect of uh, transportation of the sample, then the results which may come within 24 to 72 hours. Uh, 
So these people are trained to make sure they deal with these uh, suspected patients. So there are guidelines that we call uh, what happens at community level and at home. And uh, the most important things in all the handling of these patients or, and even their treatment is to uphold the principles of infection prevention and control, where the person that is assisting these people and the people being assisted themselves are expected to meet certain standards as far as infection prevention and control is concerned, which I think can assist as far as handling of these patients is concerned. The other thing that he has assisted in terms of handling with uh, these patients is that he, we must know that 80% um, uh, of people that are infected with uh, the coronavirus uh, have uh, mild to no symptoms at all. So these are people ordinarily that are also expected to recover at home and with no fancy uh, treatment that is expected of them, except the support services that are expected to happen from the community level up to the people that are staying with these people suspected or confirmed and they have mild or no symptoms and mm. up infection prevention. Only 20% 20, okay. 20 of these are expected then to be treated at um, uh, health facilities and uh, mm. having mild uh, moderate to severe and only 5% then having to be critical and needing admission in ICU or high care. So already when you look at that particular system, you can be able to see that uh, even the remotest rural health center can still be able to assist people with COVID because they will be able to moderate. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. And actually, because we're talking about the sort of more extreme cases, I'm going to turn to the big hot ticket, which is dexamethasone. Dr. Jerry, tell me, is this a game changer? You're asking me loaded questions today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, we hope so. Uh, to be completely honest, we hope so as a medical community because we've been desperate to find something that works. Uh, there's been different medications along the way that we've used. The dexamethasone, uh, we are optimistic about. Uh, in reading the press release, the problem is it's a press release. Um, it was 6,000 patients. Uh, 2,000 of them got dexamethasone and did better per the press release. Um, as a medical community, there is, we would <laughs> like to see the actual <laughs> manuscript um, uh, because we would like to see if it was good science. Uh, I, I, I am convinced it will be. It was done out of Oxford. They had a lot of patients. They have their protocol out, but it's still a, um, you want to make sure it's good science. So do I believe in dexamethasone? Uh, potentially, yes. Uh, it's a low dose. And if it could potentially improve outcomes, then yes. Uh, but then it's within a certain uh, subpopulation of people. So uh, as Dr. Nick was saying, most people don't become very ill and most people don't need to be in the hospital. It's the very critically ill people, uh, the people who are needing high amounts of oxygen in which it potentially reduces mortality. So the people that end up seeing me in the ICU, for mm -hmm. instance, uh, that's the potential people who are going to benefit from this. So it's not a for everyone drug, uh, unfortunately, uh, but it may make things better for people who end up being the sickest. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. I, I deliberately put you on the the spot there because I knew that you need to log off soon so I thought I'd give you all the difficult fiery questions before you you bow out. <laughs> Dr. Kudzai who had run away from us is back welcome. So I had started off by asking you a question that you conveniently disappeared for which was around your role as that guy who's understanding the character of COVID and kind of thinking through how Zimbabwe is going to respond and what it means for the individual who actually has the virus. We've addressed that now so I'm going to stick to this dexamethasone question what is your take on the drug? Oh, I kind of agree with Dr. Jerry there that uh, we really need some game changers uh, in terms of COVID management. And uh, a lot of drugs or medicines have been put out to say this can help. And we've been following the signs, uh, including when we started to hear that chloroquine can be used for COVID-19, as well as the ant other antiretrovirus drugs that we already use in the country that they're used for COVID-19. And so far, we have no concrete uh, evidence to say this really works. We want, we, we want I think, the scientists to, to probe more and give us a medicine that we say, 
this really treats uh, COVID-19. As yet, uh, there's, there's nothing on the market. Dexamethasone is more for people who are maybe, I would say, severely ill or critically ill. And yet, um, majority of our patients, if you, as, as I think Dr. Nick was saying, do not really require any medicines because they are either have mild uh, flu-like symptoms, which resolve uh, with the usual uh, symptomatic management. Okay, so coming back to my point earlier on about social determinants of health, I'm wondering, for the Zimbabwean population where you've got an issue with HIV AIDS, what COVID means to that population of society? Because again, you've got people who perhaps are a little bit reticent to go and seek help. They're kind of trying to self-manage if they have symptoms, maybe even afraid to go and seek professional support. What is your take on a combination of antiretrovirals and then just thinking beyond that to just managing HIV and AIDS, to managing the prospect of COVID and everything that goes with it? For care, it is important that people who have got HIV and are antiretrovirals to continue taking their medicines. I think there are a lot of things that people have done, I think, to manage flu, flu remedies that are home remedies. I remember when I was growing up, I would drink, I think it's a guava. I can't remember what my, my grandmother would used to give me, but I think it's guava leaves or something <laughs> to manage the flu. But generally, most flus uh, recover even without any medicine. So the usual taking of uh, fluids is very important. Boosting your vitamin C is very important. So those are things that people need to take cognizance of. And obviously, if you've got a fever, the taking of uh, paracetamol or antipyretics is also important so, that, so as to lower the fever. But to take uh, antiretrovirals without prescriptions is not uh, the way to go. So I know people would want to self-medicate. And at some point in Harare, we had, uh, I think, chloroquine running out because people had heard that chloroquine is a medicine that can be used to treat uh, COVID-19. So Mm. those things I think people should not do because all drugs have got side effects. And uh, if they're not prescribed by medical practitioners after thorough assessment, then they may have dire consequences than what the the COVID-19 would do. And on the issue of dire consequences, one of the consequences we've seen out of this virus is the stigma that goes with contracting COVID-19. And I want to now talk to the business community. Karen, I'm coming for you. Karen, talk us through just this this notion of that employee who's contracted COVID-19, has been given the all clear, has gone back to work, but everybody in the office is like, please go back home. We don't want you around here. What would you say to people who are one, just not quite understanding that there needs to be a tolerance and just about stigma generally because it sucks for the want of a better expression. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mucha. I think that um, first of all, we as the, the um, not only just the employers, but just as the perhaps the business leaders and within the organization, whether it's the directors or the managers or the ones who are in authority or who the ones who are leading teams, first of all, or the ones who are informed, they're the ones who really need to educate. I think most companies, whether the the, the employees are at work or still at home, need to make sure that there's constant communication to educate their employees as well as their colleagues about COVID and that it's, you know, um, it's not, uh, you know, the plague where you're going to, if you look at the person, you're going to get the disease <laughs> or, you know, they, they would, um, and that if they're practicing all of the safe um, protocols, which are in place, it will help them. But it's also to educate the, you know, to sit down and have a discussion and go through all of these things to explain to the employee that, you know, the temperatures get checked in the morning. If they do have a temperature, uh, you know, twice a day or three times a day, even their temperatures get checked. If they are have recovered and they've come back to work, I think people should embrace, not physically <laughs> embrace them, but say. really, <laughs> <laughs> really, you know, be, 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 be happy that they've, they've, they've been able to recover and to assist them and to celebrate the fact that they've, they've won the battle and that they are actually now probably safer than most um, of the people who haven't yet. I mean, the, the, the jury's still out, um, and Jerry may be able to answer that question. The jury's still out that on whether, if you've, re- if you've already had um, COVID, on whether you're going to um, um, you know, be able to get it again, but um, you're probably safer and you have the antibodies in you and so forth. So I think, you know, getting, tested, first of all, is important. Um, For those organizations that are able to afford to test 
their staff and they're getting proper PCR tests and not rapid tests, but PCR tests done, I think it's very important for them to um, encourage them, their, their staff to have them, but to not really waste the test if you don't have any symptoms because it's a, a very expensive test. Um, and we, we, we're not like the US and all the other countries where we can afford to test hundreds of thousands of people. So we need to try to keep those tests for the people who do show symptoms. But again, it's really important to educate your workforce. And when they do come back to work, it's to make sure that we welcome them back and we educate their colleagues to let them know that there is no stigma that's involved with this. It's like, you know, I suppose um, um, it's a flu. Uh, it's just got a lot worse symptoms than a flu. And you're not going to come and start sneezing and coughing on everybody. But it's, it's not, um, you know, uh, uh, something that you should now... Um, ostracize the person. So that education mm -hmm. needs to happen and it needs to happen amongst organizations and as sorts of them even. We need to make sure we educate and send out newsletters and we have, you know, advertising and media and PR that goes out to educate the public. So um, very, very important uh, um, a topic to talk about. Absolutely. And I think when you start looking at the rates in Beijing that have started shooting up, you know, this idea of educating yeah. people to remain vigilant is absolutely critical um, because nobody yeah. wants a resurgence of the illness. As medical practitioners, are you finding that there are a lot of repeat, uh, repeat cases of COVID? What's the research telling us about people okay. getting it twice over? That's for anyone. Jerry? Yeah, I, I can speak somewhat to that. Um, the jury is still out, but uh, what we're finding is there are studies looking at um, people who develop antibodies after developing COVID, and some of the studies are finding people have antibodies which, which fight the disease for uh, prolonged periods of time after having had the disease. So the likelihood is once you've had it, you're safe. That's the likelihood. Um, there were reports to begin with of people testing positive and then uh, after they've been sick, having a negative test and then later having a positive test. And I think that's where the concern was from. Uh, but the testing characteristics of the COVID test aren't fantastic. So one of the questions is, did they test negative falsely um, in between? Um, so the likelihood okay. is you are safe and you're probably the safest person after you've had it. Um, uh, that, <laughs> that's the likelihood. Um, but um, the, the jury is still somewhat out. It is, it is novel, uh, unfortunately, the coronavirus is. So we're finding out more. And what is yeah, the mystery would... behind children as well? So it, please go ahead. But I do want to kind of address this issue. What is the mystery about kids? Why don't kids get it at the same rate that elderly people and grown-ups do? But if you wanted to address, I think you might want to tag on to what Dr. Jerry said, Dr. Goodbye, and then maybe one of you can pick up my secondary question. All right. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, okay, first on the first question that, uh, okay, we, we had a conference with the Chinese uh, medical teams that were managing cases in China. And out of all the cases that they had, I think there were only 52 cases that they queried uh, reinfection and they were still in, uh, investigating whether it was real infection or what Dr. Jerry was saying that maybe uh, in between uh, they had false negatives. So that's, that's something that we're still uh, uh, trying to find out. But basically what, what, is, what is known or what the majority of cases have shown is that once you have had it, uh, there's not been uh, repeats. I think the, the repeats are less than 0.001%. So most likely when you yes. have it, yeah, you, you, you are safe. Then the second they question is also a miss. Hello. Repeats. Sorry, Karen. Sorry, please go ahead, Dr. Dubai. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in terms of children, I think uh, people are still investigating. But uh, what, what I think what started initially was that it doesn't affect children, but that's, a, that's, a, that's false. Actually, we've seen that to be false. Here in Harare, I think we've had uh, almost 20 children now that have had uh, COVID-19. So it does affect children, but uh, the severity of the illness is what is still less uh, in children than in those, in those that are adults and those with chronic conditions. I saw a question on the group that's asking uh, some a lady called uh, Anna Marie. Nyakabao is commenting on how oncologists use dexamethasone as well. So is there a scramble for this drug that we foresee for any sector of medicine that might feel that they should have first dibs at it? 
should it prove the magic cure? Uh, that is a great question and a scary question. Um, and um, I, I would agree with Dr. Yakaba. There, there are instances where dexamethasone is used uh, and it's a great medication, especially for people who have cancer. It, it reduces it shrinks sometimes the tumor while they're getting chemo in. Um, so it's an important drug and we fear shortages long-term because as people scramble and people are scrambling, uh, dexamethasone may, uh, we may see shortages just like we saw with hydroxychloroquine at some point. Um, so I think that's, that's why it's important to emphasize that it's going to be a, a small population of people that it actually helps. And those are the sickest of the sick people who have COVID. Uh, but that being said, unfortunately there's going to be a scramble for the medication it is cheap it has been made it, it's, it's manufactured internationally uh, so potentially will be more available than something like hydroxychloroquine which is a little bit more specialized uh, so hopefully we won't run out of supplies for it but there will be a scramble uh, and we need to emphasize that it is it from what we're seeing from the data uh, or what was released of the data uh, it, it only works in the subset of people so what if the school of thought that says there is a good alternative what is the medical guidance on this where there's someone like, actually, we've got an alternative drug that may be a little less potent than DEXA. I'm going to just call it that instead of the long dexamethasone. Uh, but what would you say to people who are kind of looking for, for what they believe are viable alternatives and self-diagnosing or self-medicating? I would, I would caution about that. I mean, uh, I, would, I would definitely caution people about that, especially if it's actual medications. Uh, it's, so for instance, for the flu, um, people have their own remedies. Some people will do, what is it, lemon and honey, whatever it is. There's things that make you feel better and they help with the symptoms. And I think it's, it's important for us as a medical community to say, that's fine. Take your, drink your tea, your chamomile tea, whatever it is, that's important. But then self-medicating with some other alternative drugs um, as a as an individual, I would recommend against. Now, there are other steroids. Dexamethasone is a steroid medication. There are other steroids um, that work similarly. Now, from what I've read, and it, it, this is going to be one of the questions that everyone is asking is, are the other steroids going to work just as well? They did dexamethasone 6, uh, which is a relatively low to medium dose. Uh, dexamethasone is a very potent steroid, but that's a lower dose of that steroid. I don't know, and I don't know if anyone does know if the other steroids will work as well, but there are other corticosteroids that have similar uh, uh, functions that could potentially work. And that's that would be the goal and the hope potentially. So for a, a non-medical person, can either of you maybe talk me through what the steroid actually does physically to reduce the symptoms, to help cure COVID? How does it physically work in the body? What's it doing? Yeah, so um, COVID in itself is, is, is a virus like the flu. Uh, so it will affect you, it will, it will infect your cells, it will enter your cells. And the front end of the illness is just like the flu where it's entering into your cells. What your body does, um, and I, I'm speaking now from a lung perspective, I'm a lung doctor, is typically once you've been affected by COVID, your body goes to fight that infection. So you have a heightened inflammation and inflammation is your body just trying to fight that infection very hard. And sometimes what will happen is your body overreacts to the actual infection and you become more sick because of your body's overreaction, this, this heightened inflammatory response. So what steroids do is they will reduce that, that inflammatory response. They actually reduce your immune system to a certain extent, and they, um, they will reduce that level of inflammation that you have. So the body's overreaction potentially will be reduced somewhat. And that's, that's part of the theory behind how steroids uh, work, is reducing the inflammation in your body's overreaction. But if it's suppressing that, aren't you then susceptible to other viruses or other illnesses because your immunity is going to be snipped that is that is why there's a debate and people want to see the data uh with other coronaviruses before uh when people were given steroids some of them got other infections and potentially did worse uh they got other infections um and or did worse from the actual virus so that's why people want to see the data uh, it's a that's a very astute question and that's a question that everyone is asking hopefully with the low dose, mm, please sir. Go, go for it Hopefully with a lower dose, it doesn't uh, uh, depress your immunity as much, but uh, I'm, I'm now out of data and I am conjecturing. I, I, I'm not supporting <laughs> what I'm saying with data. So I would love data first. Okay. <laughs>
So you kind of missed that big question, Dr. Kudzal was asking about using a steroid as it suppresses yeah. COVID-19, what's mm -hmm. happening to the rest of your immunity? So, you know, we would want to just understand a bit about the physical stuff that's happening with the human body at the point that you've got COVID-19. Dr. Jerry has very eloquently explained what's physically happening to you. Um, challenges this idea of taking a steroid that suppresses your immunity and then opens you up to everything else. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's a very good question because uh, steroids, like what Dr. Jerry said, uh, generally lower your immune system. And we know that people who have got a lowered immune system with COVID-19 are generally prone to getting severe forms of the disease. So which means uh, like uh, when, I think when they were started before, these were things that happened. But uh, this controlled trial that has been done in, in, in the United Kingdom has shown us otherwise that dexamethasone, which is like the steroid, when given to those that are severely ill, uh, it actually improved outcomes. So it's important, I think, to, to understand uh, how this has happened. And we hope if we get more of the information, then we can easily, I think for, for, for most uh, clinicians, uh, they want to understand uh, really that this, this uh, benefit has really happened so that they're, even, they're confident to prescribe it when uh, they're faced with similar patients. Wonderful, thank you. That's really, really informative. Thank you both very much. Yeah. Dr. Nick, coming to you, I haven't been ignoring you, but I've been weaving my story so that I could come and ask you this super question. So you've got Wilkins <laughs> Hospital under your belt and we know that we've got patients coming in. Can, I, can you talk us through the patient load there? Can you tell us what's happening at Wilkins Hospital? And can you tell us how prepared for all the work and the donations and the supports that the hospital has had for this retrofit? How effectively do you see it working in the near to long term? Which uh, is actually Dr. Kudzai, who's that's, from- that's what, That should it's be my Dr. question. It's Dr. Kudzai. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dr. <laughs> Kudzai. I'm back at you. I'm just kind of seeing you all as being these all knowledgeable doctors who know everything that's going on on the ground. Sorry, if you don't mind taking that and I'll come back to you, Dr. Nick, with something related, I'm sure. All right, I, I, I think Dr. Nick would have answered something because he knows I think things are happening there. But anyway, yeah, sure. so so basically uh, we've got two isolation facilities in the city of Harare, which is Wilkins Hospital and uh, Beatrice Road Infectious Disease Hospital. What we had designed was that uh, Wilkins Hospital is supposed to admit the uh, more severe to critically ill patients, and then Beatrice Road Infectious Disease Hospital is supposed to admit the mild to uh, if they're symptomatic to mild cases. So we have, I think at the moment, about 33 patients admitted at Wilkins and 12 uh, admitted at Beatrice Road Infectious Disease Hospital. But both hospitals still have a bit of work that needs to happen. At Wilkins, I think it's almost complete. Uh, that's why we've got more patients. But for Beatrice, which is supposed to host uh, 120 patients, uh, still has renovations that are outstanding. So we're hoping that the patients that are there, if they recover, then uh, would complete the renovations so that it's, it opens up to be able to admit more cases. Fortunately for us, uh, in the past two months, I think our cases have been mostly mild and uh, without much uh, comorbidities, but we've had some challenging ones, but fortunately for us, they've uh, recovered and uh, actually gone home uh, with negative results. So th th that's been a positive over the past two months. Yeah. Sure, very good. So Dr. Nick, oh. I am really coming to you now for, for, for an answer. When you kind of start thinking through the analytics from the hotline, what patterns are you seeing in terms of the sorts of symptoms people are calling the hotline for? Is it working as intended? Or is it being seen as the answer to every medical problem? Because I don't perhaps have money for a consultation, let me ring the hotline and ask about dandruff or are people using it as you as you <laughs> clearly intended it to be used for? <laughs> um, basically, I can simply say that um, as a hotline that is um, a toll free number, it is not immune to uh, prank calls that we are receiving in large numbers where people play around with the calls and exhausting the doctors that are uh, taking these calls. So basically, that's the first message that we want to put across to say, don't call the hotline if you have no business to do with the hotline, because you are preventing an opportunity for someone who wants help to then get the access. get access, yeah. For yeah. those that are also then calling, there is, a, there is a considerable number of people that are calling the hotline 
for general assistance. You know what COVID has done is it has diverted attention away from the day-to-day -day, uh, medical issues that we have been dealing with and be dealing only with COVID. And therefore, people that are calling the hotline are having an opportunity to be assisted as far as their day-to-day -day, uh, medical issues are concerned. Some are getting advice on the line and some are being advised to go to the health centers depending on the severity of the disease they would have called for. But by and large, uh, people can have, uh, in a pandemic, people can have what we call psychosomatic symptoms where you actually self-diagnose yourself to have COVID. <laughs> <laughs> you are assisted and you feel better because we are seeing a lot of people, if we were to go by the statistics of people who call and actually have what we can call textbook symptoms of COVID, otherwise all these facilities will be full of people that have got these COVID symptoms. But because we are assisting them over the phones and a good number of them not actually then having COVID, we are assisting to ensure that we flatten the curve as far as people who Dr. Masunda would be seeing at the institutions would then reduce and they pay attention to the actual people that need attention there. So on that front, it is working. You find that we also have relatives of people that have been diagnosed and are in self-isolation at home who need the support on a day-to-day -day basis that we assist them to cope with the people that are in self-isolation at home. When they talk to these doctors, they are getting the help as far as being able to continuously follow the IPC uh, protocols in terms of infection prevention. So sometimes when we get little to no statistics as far as community transmission is concerned, we feel that the hotline doctors are helping as far as that front is concerned by continuously engaging and talking to people who are staying with people that are in self-isolation. We are also uh, educating people in terms of the stigma, how stigma comes about. There is the stigma that people can uh, stigmatize someone who has had COVID, but there is also the aspect of self-stigmatization. Someone who had COVID who feel that people are shunning him when they are not. And we're encouraging people to continuously engage their colleagues who would have had COVID so that they continuously feel loved so that when they recover, they don't then self-stigmatize. And we have been seeing and help coming through as far as that is concerned. If we look the core volumes that are coming through the hotline, the statistics that we are collecting, the numbers that we have, you will find that there is help. So I can conclude by saying the hotline is playing its role and assisting the population. Wonderful. Well done, hotline team. And well done to you for spearheading this initiative. I think it's absolutely brilliant that people are not risking their health by sort of getting into public transport and trying to seek support. When, as you quite rightly point out, more often than not, it may not actually be a big deal. You've just got a sore throat because you've breathed in too much dust or whatever it might be or it's winter temperatures dropped and you've got a genuine cold. As we start to wrap up, because we're, we're reaching the top of the hour, we have lost Dr. Jerry, he's had to go back to work. This is what happens when you've got people who work critical care on the panel. But if he does tune in and watch this, we appreciate his time tonight. For my two remaining experts, and of course, Karen, let me know what you are determined to see happen over the next three to six months. And actually, in fact, it's a two-part question. What you're determined to see happen in, in terms of people's attitudes towards an illness such as this. So we've talked about themes such as stigmatization, we've talked about, you know, the duty of care within societies, but is there a behavior that you've seen that you're determined to either change or fight just so that people are responsible with their expectations around how they manage COVID-19, part one. Part two is what is the first thing you're going to do to celebrate when COVID is over and you don't have to worry about this dreadful disease? For me, um, I, I expect people to continue to uphold uh, the infection prevention and control uh, issues mm. as far as COVID is concerned. Uh, things are of uh, making sure that we have clean hands uh, through washing our hands with soap and water and hand sanitization. They have been proved to assist as far as transmission of COVID is concerned. So until we have zero cases the world over, 
that's when probably we can relax as far as that is concerned. We still have so to So you're keep... not going to celebrate until we've got zero rate? Or yeah, because... do you think that at the point that it seems a little bit more manageable, then you can kind of exhale? We are not going to take chances when even um, numbers reduce. Uh, we, have, we are learning every day as far as COVID is concerned. Uh, Beijing was open to people moving around and everything, and boom, they are closed again because people had relaxed. Mm. So we must learn from that. Mm. And uh, mm. also of wearing masks when people are in public places, we must stay with that until again we, we have nothing as far as the cases are concerned. Uh, to me, sure. these are the core issues, including issues of social distancing that we must be mm. able to uphold. But what I will so celebrate, what I will celebrate post COVID is uh, the health delivery system. I'm sure would have improved to certain levels post COVID because of the efforts sure. that people are putting, including sort Zim, as far as revamping the health delivery system is concerned. So there is a point to celebrate post COVID as far as that is concerned. Okay, so we've got Dr. Nick, the purist, who will not dare celebrate until the last case of COVID has been identified and dealt with. What's your take, Dr. Dubai? Okay, uh, I think Dr. Nick is, uh, I think he is very, I think, pessimistic in terms of, of, of COVID-19. <laughs> we, 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 we are really seeing that uh, even in Europe, where cases are still high, they've seen that you still need to survive even during a COVID outbreak. So I think there's still need for a balance uh, in terms of uh, our social well-being, COVID well-being, economic well-being, so that we can at least do something while it's the COVID is there. But maintaining what Dr. Nick has said, still the social distancing has to be there. Still the wearing of masks has to be done. Still the washing of hands and, uh, you know, general hygiene practices have to be up. Because these are things that not only prevent COVID-19, but prevent many other the infectious diseases like the cholera that we with that we have seen the typhoids that we continuously see here in Harare uh, these measures can help us to break the chain uh, of transmission of all these other diseases so maintaining the hygiene standards that we are setting with the covid-19 i think is essential for us to beat not only covid-19 but all the other infectious diseases for for me when the covid is over i think i'll take my family for a holiday somewhere wonderful and, anyway, <laughs> and anyway, in zimbabwe not outside of course <laughs> <laughs> well, borders would need to open, wouldn't they? Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And then, Karen, will wearing makeup ever be the same, do you think? Because when you wear that mask, it just kind of ruins your flow, right? <laughs> In fact, I was going to say that there needs to be education on the masks. I mean, when you look at some of the masks that are being worn by some of the people, um, they're probably carrying more infection. <laughs> <laughs> And they're swapping them, they're swapping them, and I'm not sure if they're washing them properly, and I just, I'm not sure that we are, you know, being as diligent as we should be with wearing of masks. So, so you know, the education around COVID needs to continue. Um, I don't, I am of the opinion, I'm one of those, I'm not speaking just for Satsim, I'm speaking from a personal perspective, that life does have to go on. I can't wait for the day that we actually officially open St. Anne's and I plan to have a party. I hope by then, you know, um, they will have allowed us to open restaurants. We've been spending the whole week advocating, all the restaurant owners are advocating to, op to reopen restaurants, to reopen the place where you can have a glass of wine responsibly. And I've been saying to the restaurant owners, look, government has really put in place, you know, um, um, stringent measures to not open restaurants, for example. But we need to start reopening, but with discipline, and to try to make sure that we have policies in place where people are responsible. If they're going to have a drink, they're going to drink responsibly. We're not going to have road accidents. Death toll in Zimbabwe is way down, but that's because there's been no road accidents, for example, and no commuter buses on the roads. So we need to get we need to get order. While we have this opportunity, it's the best time to get people to be disciplined and to, you know, I can't wait to be able to reopen um, the restaurants again, do it responsibly. Of course, you know, we it's not going to be where we're going to be irresponsible, but life does have to go on. People need their jobs. People need an income. And um, Dr. Nick, even though I hear what you're saying, 
again. This is it, uh, uh, living with COVID and being in lockdown cannot be the norm. I refuse it to be the norm. We need to get back to living and we need to thank God for the amazing, uh, um, I believe that Zimbabwe and Africa has escaped quite uh, uh, miraculously what has happened in the rest of the world. And it could be many factors which will come out later on that we might discover that it could be that we're exposed to more bacteria anywhere than anywhere else in the world. Other places may live in a world that's so sterile, whereas here we walk, we walk bare feet, people drink water from Mukaguzi River and they don't get sick. <laughs> so our, our immunity is higher. It could be the vitamin D, it could be the BCG, it's so many things. I did want to speak about the fact that we must never dismiss things like, you know, cures or not cures, but remedies that come out of Africa, like the Madagascar tonic. I mean, that could, you know, maybe if it was investigated and, you know, really looked at, it could have been something that could have, have helped um, if they were able to do proper test cases and test studies on it. Um, the minute we see something that's come out of the West, we think that that's the medicine that's going to work. You know what? Who knows? Maybe the medicine and the, you know, and, 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 the, and the cure, so to speak, um, if there is such a thing, may come out of Africa. So they should be making that investigation. So let's try as much as we can to be responsible, be disciplined, try to get back to a new type of norm that is not boring and, and, and so, so, so dreary that people are miserable. We need to start seeing smiles again. And we can only do that by getting back to work and, and, and getting back into the fold and the, the scheme of things. Dr. Nick is looking at me very worried. Don't worry, Dr. Nick. I'm not going to, go. I'm not going to destroy. I'm not going to destroy everybody. Kudzai, I saw you nodding your head. So I hope that you're in agreement with me, Dr. Kudzai. Yeah, I think yes, just to balance the scales. I'm going to just to be controversial and balance the scales. I'm going to go with Dr. Nick. Dr. Nick, I think we want the last case of COVID-19 before we exhale. How about that? <laughs> Right, well, we've come to the top of the hour now. Um, Karen, I'm not sure if you wanted to talk about Sotsim. Do you have anything to plug in for, for Sotsim before we wrap up? Um, the only thing I would suggest, say is we really would still really appreciate any donations, any, um, you know, um, whether it's in kind or PPE or anything that you have um, that's available. We are very happy to accept them. We want to say thank you to all the people who have donated this week. It's been fantastic. Um, we've been endorsed, like I said, by a few NGOs, which is fantastic as well. The hospital is ready. We just um, put in some fine touches to things like contracts for doctors. We don't want to sign contracts with doctors and then they've got no patients, but we still have to pay them. Um, so we're still making sure that we're raising enough money to be able to do that. Um, and we're looking at all the other institutions that we want to get ready in the health sector. So thank you very, very much, Mucha. Thank you, Garai. Thank you, Dr. Kudzai. It was short notice. Thank you, Mucha, always, for being such an amazing moderator. We so appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Nick, who tirelessly works that hotline 2019, which is the Ministry of Health hotline, which Solidarity Trust runs on behalf of the Ministry of Health. We are very thankful for to be able to do that, which is hosted by Dande Mutande and all the telcos, NetOne, Tel One, Econet and Telesal donate those lines and we're thankful to them um, for, for doing that. So thank you so much um, to everybody. Over to you, Mucha. Well, thank you, Karen. I would like to thank you all. So Dr. Jerry, Dr. Gazai, Dr. Nick for joining us tonight. You've been an amazing panel. I stand in solidarity with you, Dr. Nick, in appealing to Zimbabweans not to waste the time of people running those uh, hotlines. It really is irresponsible to call with anything that's not COVID related. Um, so please just be respectful of people's time, be respectful of people's intellect, be respectful of people's professions and call a girlfriend or something if you're bored and you don't have anyone to talk to. Aside from that, thank you to Zimbabwe for joining us tonight. We always look forward to having you every Thursday, 6 p.m. on May Kill Mark with Sotsin. Look forward to seeing you again next week with another topic. Don't know what it is yet, but I'm sure we'll find out soon enough. Take care and good night.